Hey, uh, I'm actually very, very happy because until five minutes ago, this computer just stuck at the apple and the spinning wheel and didn't do anything whatsoever and didn't tell me what it's doing wrong. So that's always that's what I always love about closed technology. Like, oh, the thing is broken. You probably have to go to some genius and fix it for you because you're an idiot. Thanks for your money, by the way. And uh, so I want to talk a bit about the web as a platform and what Mozilla does. Uh, a lot of people think Mozilla is only Firefox and it's a browser that was awesome and it's still okay. But I mean, I, I, my, the first sentence when I talk to people and I say I'm from Mozilla, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I use Chrome. <laughs> and it always fascinates me because I'm like, I should be sorry for you. No, um, it always means like, it's not only Firefox that we do. Mozilla is a, is a non-profit uh, organization to keep the web open and keep the web free. And that is a very important part of the web that many people haven't understood that like, every year we have to fight for keeping the internet free for people and keeping the internet available for people and keeping the technologies easy to do. I originally was a radio journalist, and then in 1996 I found the internet and thought, that's pretty awesome. And I taught myself HTML and had my first website, and from there on I got jobs doing that. And I didn't go to university, I don't have a degree, I didn't learn anything officially. My parents always wonder why I'm not homeless. But it <laughs> means that everybody's invited to do something, and we're the fighting uh, organization for that. And a lot of people try to lock you in on the web and say like, oh, it's one browser only and look how fast it is and shiny it is. And that's what another company said in 1996 as well. And that's why we have all these companies that now have software that can't be upgraded from Internet Explorer 6 to something new because that was the only browser to ever support. So what we do is not only Firefox, we talk about technology that is available in all browsers and should be available in all browsers. So the web is an amazing thing. This is the coverage of the Internet worldwide. And uh, I wish this all were bright and like really bright blinking and unicorns and rainbows and stuff, but it isn't yet. But it's still interesting to see that like, I'm not sure many of you have seen African websites or actually looked at Russian websites and things like that. But it's incredibly inspiring to look at all these websites and see what they, how they approach design and these kind of things. It's, it's, it's really cool to see that it's a worldwide thing and not just an American thing or a Silicon Valley thing. So when you see, for example, I also work for Yahoo, and when I see the kids Yahoo website, this is the official website for kids in Korea, and it's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, the thing is huge. For in our standards, no no web uh, no project manager would allow this to get through. But over there, the connections are like three megabit on a phone, and that's just that's just lo uh, the smallest you can get or slowest you can get. So people get nuts and do good things on the internet with that, and they're not afraid of it. And this was in Tokyo last month where we do these Hackasaurus things where we get six to eight year old kids or 10 year old kids and let them do their first programming things with like a drag and drop code editor or make them, uh, make them change a game and put their own little images or photos in there and things like that. And it's incredible to see these like six year old Japanese kid doing some coding and explaining to the Firefox what she's been doing in the last three minutes. And it was just beautiful to see that because, I mean, when I had my first computer, I turned it on, it was blinking, and I had to put everything in there, and my parents told me I should go outside and play football instead. <laughs> so it's much more natural these days. And in a lot of cases, it also means change, political change and interest change. Like, this is uh, 18 Days in Egypt, which is actually built with Mozilla Popcorn, which is a JavaScript library and a what you see is what you get editor to mix video content with web content. So they took the speech of the Egyptian uh, president and showed all the news around that, why he was talking about it, what people were tweeting, what videos were recorded before that actually were counteracting what he was saying or were supporting what he was, act was saying. So with open web technology, we reinvent journalism as well. And that is incredibly important. And hackers like us, or people who really care about technology, can help people uh, free themselves much better than the main media can because they will be controlled by the state. I was in, uh, I was with, uh, with Georgia Tech, I had a project with Liberia. Journalists would film things in Liberia and they couldn't upload them. The Crimes Against Humanity, they couldn't upload them or get them to the main press because the government controls the only pipe on the internet. So what we've written is an, a mobile application, funnily enough, that would allow you to film something and then cut it up into 16 pieces and upload it from 16 different mobile phones over 3G. 
And at the other end, some journalists can put it together to a video again. Much like BitTorrent works as well. You never know what the data is. But that way, we use the internet to give people a chance to report crimes against humanity, and that's a great thing. Uh, the problem that we always had with the web was it was limited technologies. In HTML4 and HTML3.2, we had like headings, paragraphs, images, tables, forms, done. Be creative now. And our design departments came up with these like science fiction Jackson's things that we had to put into HTML somehow. And it was just very annoying because every time we had to do everything with images or we had to hack with like table layouts, uh, space adjifs, all kind of stuff just to make it work in that browser that should be dead years ago. And then HTML5 came around and we said like, you know what, this is all not working. This is all not, uh, the, the problem that we have is that HTML was defined for a web of documentation. It was documents, it was uh, 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 articles written in universities that link to other articles with a hyperlink. The hyperlink was a revolution, but uh, in the end it was not enough anymore. Because computing and the internet became so ubiquitous that people wanted to have more. We wanted to have video, we wanted to have games, we wanted to have music, we wanted to have interaction that wasn't possible with HTML because it was never defined. So in HTML5 we took that further and went into a world of applications. So we took old technology and actually put new things on top of it to make it much cooler to play with and much cooler to work in. So Mario Super Mario with Scorpio in it would be quite awesome to play. And yeah, you've got time later, you can go for it. So it's built, HTML5 is built on great principles that others had as well. It's open for all. It's like from the beginning, it says like you don't need one browser to get HTML5. You cannot do HTML5.exe and install it. It's just the technology that runs in browsers, is supported by search engines, is supported by user agents. So assistive technology like screen readers or, or Zoom software also benefits from what HTML5 ha has for them. It's backwards compatible. So by default, we don't say like you need to have an HTML5 browser. An old browser should get something that makes sense. It should not be the same. It should not be the, the exact same functionality, but it should be something that explains to you either why you're missing out or give you the basic information. And the rest is then beautiful because the newer browsers can do it. And it works well with other standards. HTML5 has become this umbrella thing that like companies that do marketing with it say everything is HTML5. It's not, but at the same time, I don't care anymore because HTML5 is the new thing that came in and opened the door for other great new technologies that we have, like local storage APIs, like uh, uh, databases in the browser. These are all not part of HTML5 or CSS for like transitions and animations, but they actually, people are much more likely to use them right now because we already realized with HTML5 something new is there. So it's always quite fun when people are like, oh, this is not HTML5, you have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, don't do that. You're the, you're the guy that lives in his mother's basement when you do that. <laughs> so it, it starts on a powerful base, on a basis that actually we had with HTML as well, it's, but it, it puts new things on it. We have richer HTML semantics. We've got articles, we've got navigation, we've got uh, summary and details. A lot of things that we had to simulate in, in JavaScript in the past, we now have in HTML. We got new form functionality, we got like sliders, we've got date pickers, and whoever came up with time and date hated programmers, because there's really no fun in doing that. But having a date picker that is just a calendar, so I don't have to think about it, is awesome. That's wonderful to have. Uh, validation of forms. In the past, we always had to use uh, server-side uh, validation and client-side validation, so the thing doesn't get sent off. Nowadays, I put a, a, a required attribute on an HTML form, and it will not send off until that field has been filled in. I don't have to write JavaScript for that and replicate it on the server side anyways, because if you only do validation on the client side, you will be hacked. You have Canvas for painting and animating. So Canvas is a low-level API that just allows you to do animations in the browser, paint in the browser. The other thing what I've done with it two days ago was like I put some flying pigs into the browser, so that's done with uh, Canvas as well. So you can do silly things with it, but you can just do painting programs and all kinds of things with it as well. It's pretty beautiful. You have browser history access. That was the big problem when Ajax came around. Out of a sudden, we didn't reload the whole page, but only that article, which made total sense. But the URL didn't change. So when I sent that URL to a friend, he just went to the, fr to the front page and said, like, what are you on about? So with his browser history access, I can actually manipulate the history of the browser and have backwards and forward buttons and bookmarking and things still working, although I'm not reloading the page. And we should not break these things that people have been conditioned to use. We've got video and audio. 
like video and audio is now an element like any other element in the page. I can style it, I can rotate it, I can hide it, I can stretch it, I can do all kinds of things with it. The fun thing I've done was just double something. I always was annoyed by, uh, by the Star Wars movie when they actually um, said like, oh, it's not Earth, because if you go outside the building, you will see that it's like two suns and not only one. So I said like, you know what, I don't care. It's like it was done on Earth, so we might as well show that. <laughs> And that shows that actually HTML is just another thing in the page. And you can manipulate it with like event handler and dragging things around. And before that, that was not possible unless you wrote it in Flash. We have drag and drop, which is always a good thing to have. We have browser menus. So the, you can actually access part of the browser from HTML and to make real applications like right-click menus. And you have offline and local storage. That's what a lot of people still get confused about. Like, oh, yeah, can... I always have to be online when I do HTML5. No, you always have to be online when you take the newest Angry Birds. That's a different story, but it's just offline storage and local storage works in HTML5, much like anywhere else. And with CSS, we can actually get rid of, uh, uh, get rid of Photoshop or not. Like a lot of stuff we had to do in Photoshop in the past, like rounded corners, images for everything, can be done now, now done in CSS. We've got rounded corners, drop shadows, gradients, transformations, animation, transitions, 3D. All of these things work in CSS now, and you don't have to be a, a 3D animator or you don't have to know your Photoshop just to make something blue with round corners, because in the next iteration it will be green with round corners, and you don't want to create new images for that. So CSS gives you all that cool stuff nowadays. Let's have a few examples. So this is the Beanie Maker. Um, so you can drag and drop an image into the browser, and then you use Canvas to put a blue beanie on a dog, which is obviously something that your, your bosses always want you to do. But it just shows that I can manipulate an image in the browser, and I can drag and drop the image into the browser rather than having this unwieldy upload button and put it somewhere on a server. And when I'm done with it, I can just right-click it and save it as an image. So Canvas allows me to actually paint on top of other images. Videos and, and pictures can be a source for Canvas rather than just you painting everything. And this was done in a few minutes just to try it out. And the drag and drop code is the thing that I don't see enough people do. It really annoys me that every content management system comes with a flash uploader because you, you just basically want to upload 10 files at a time. And the drag and drop here, for example, this is all you have to do. You have an event listener for the drop uh, event which is much like a click event or a touch event or all the other events that you have in the browser. You have data transfer files. So these are all the files that were dragged into the browser. So I could zip them up and upload them in one go, for example, instead of uploading 200 files. So all these things are possible nowadays in the client, and that's across the different HTML browsers. This is like Firefox, Chrome, Opera, uh, Internet Explorer, maybe, probably, yeah, Internet Explorer 9 and 10. And this is all the code you have for it. It's pretty impressive what you can do nowadays with a few lines. Adding your own menus. This is, for example, here, if I right-click on this one, I've got two functions, which are rotate and resize. These are not in the browser normally. So I can now resize the, or rotate this HTML logo or resize it or resize it back to the main size and rotate it back. And all I had to do to make this work is not even write JavaScript. Well, one JavaScript, but not much. So... The main code is a uh, uh, context menu equals image menu on the element that it's in. And then I have a menu and I give it an ID of image menu. And there I have a label called rotate with an image and a label called resize with an image. And they call two functions called rotate and resize. The JavaScript of that one actually just toggles a class on the element. So it puts a class called rotate or resize on the element. And the rest is done with a transition and a transform. So I rotate it in the transform, and in transition, I just tell whatever changes in that CSS from one state to another, do it within 0.2 seconds rather than do it immediately. And this is amazing how, how you can make good-looking interfaces, good-looking interactions without having to do any calculation yourself or animation yourself. So uh, you can take that further. You can do cropping images in the browser. That was a functionality I always wanted to have, and I didn't want to write an add-on. So actually... And show that live here. So you got this wonderful image of the puking unicorn here. And you can right click that and say crop. And uh, oh, then when you crop it, it becomes darker. You define what you want to define. You double click it, it crops the image, and I can save the image to my hard drive because the image itself has been manipulated in the browser. 
I'm not doing an overflow or something like that or hide it with diff elements. I really manipulate the images on a pixel level with, with canvas. And it's pretty impressive what you can do with that. And it's just a little functionality that makes total sense. Um, you can build games, of course, and uh, Rob is going to talk about that in a lot of detail. And this, for example, is a simple game where you have an HTML shield and you have to catch the things that are HTML5 and the ones that are not HTML5 will actually take away points from you. And you can use it with a keyboard, you can use it with a mouse here, or you can actually use the things that the hardware gives you. And that's a big thing about HTML5 development. Test what the hardware or the interaction can do and then actually do something with it. So in this case, I'm getting too excited about my mouse here, but uh, if I skip a bit forward in that video, you see that it also works on my mobile phone, and it uses orientation in this case. So instead of having to do it with my hand and, and cover the shield, I just tilt the phone and put that in there. And that's Firefox running on the mobile as well, so I basically didn't have to rewrite it anyway because it's the same browser in both of them. Uh, Android browser doesn't do that yet, but the Chrome beta on uh, Ice Cream Sandwich actually does it as well. And uh, Safari did it for a long time on iOS. So all these things are possible from HTML and JavaScript. The other thing about that game, and I haven't released that yet, which is actually a few months ago, the whole logic of the game is written in HTML itself. So I've got in the images here a data collision and a data type. So I've got good and bad things, and the energy goes up 20 or goes down 20 when I catch them. So if you want to take that game and make it like uh, uh, your bank's website game or your company's game, just put new images in there, define new rules in the HTML itself, and you have a game that you can show to your boss and it's open source, I don't care. If you get a promotion, send me some money. <laughs> Another big thing is in the past we always had these debugging tools and people were always complaining that there's no good debuggers and nowadays they come actually with the browser. So I can actually now, in the browser, just say inspect element, and you got the inspector here. So I've got the body now, and I can say, okay, show me the HTML of the body, show me the style of the body, and I can change the styles, I can find the properties of the styles. These are all built in into Firefox, and also into Chrome, and also in, in Opera for a long, long time. So the browsers are not only uh, viewers of the web, but actually are development environments where you can debug where it happens, which is wonderful because in the, in the past I put like lots of alerts in there and hope things worked. And what really is cool is the 3D debugging, which started as like, why do we do this? Does this make any sense? But actually it turned out to be rather cool, so um, let's try that again. Hang on. Inspect elements, so I do the 3D environment. So you see the page as a 3D environment. The depth of the DOM shows you how far your HTML is actually nested. So you can, you can see these pages and you can click any of these elements as well and then show, see, for example, the style of that element. So you can debug in a, 3D, in a 3D space and for people who don't know about HTML, that made them aware that it's probably not a good idea to nest 12,000 divs and wonder why you don't know where you're debugging. If you go to some pages, it's, it's always interesting, like Facebook City, for example, is very interesting to be in. So if I go to Facebook and I do my editing here, Inspect elements. That could be embarrassing, but sadly enough, luckily enough, nobody did this. So Facebook is a bit of a higher thing than all the others when it comes to like DOM length. <laughs> or you find interesting stuff like uh, Google. I, I always thought like Google is one of the shortest pages out there, but uh, funnily enough, um, Google.com, load it, get my inspect element, get my 3D view. Dun, dun, dun. So all the, uh, all the uh, what, what that is, is all that instant stuff. All the divs and stuff have been preloaded, so you don't have to generate them. So you just type them in and you see the results, and that's the way actually Tilt, it, it was called, but now it's just the 3D viewer that we have. So one thing to think about when you start building new websites nowadays and new web applications is that we're going, we went past the click and mouse thing. You have to think about like key, per, uh, key port access, you have to think about touch access, click access, mouse move, device orientation, and even game controllers. So we have all these opportunities to control a page with different inputs, which we didn't have in the past. Which brings me to apps, but uh, Robert, uh, Robert is going to talk about that in more detail. So a big thing are apps. Like Everybody's very excited, like, ooh, apps are the future. I don't want to open a browser and type in a really, really easy to memorize URL. I'd rather have an icon in between my 50,000 icons where I can click it on it and do one thing at a time. 
So I'm not too excited about it. I'm just like, we invented the web so we don't have to install and reinstall applications all the time, but actually on a touch interface when you don't want to know what's, what's under it, that's cool. I mean, people want to play Angry Birds, and HTML5 allows you to do that as well. You have your offline storage, you have your input elements, you have everything in there to build applications for your mobile phones with these technologies. And the good thing about that one is, you write it once. You don't write an Android app or an iOS app or a, 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 I mean, whatever other technology might come in the next half year. You write it once and you can run it in all these devices. You can even use something like PhoneGap to convert it to the native code of these devices or convert it to like uh, uh, Windows 8 code or iOS code or OS X code. So all of these technologies nowadays can be converted from HTML5. But you can't write an Android app and turn it into HTML5. That's the wrong way around. Uh, quickly, browser ID is, uh, we talked about it before, it's persona, so uh, we always had the problem, I want to know what, who my users are, and here I have a button that says, like, who are you? That person can select this uh, email that they have, sign into my website, and then I say, who, who, I know you. So that's a great application demo, but actually what it means is, like, we analyzed all the login systems you have out there, and all of those fall back to two things. You have to come up with a stupid username and a really complex password that you forget as soon as you typed it in. And when you forget your password, you go to the site two weeks later, it asks you to reset your password, and what does it do? It sends you an email to reset your password. So we said, like, what's with that whole loop of username and password when your email could you be your identity? So what Browser ID, the technology or the protocol under Persona does, is make your email your identity and your several emails that you can choose from to have different identities for different websites. And you never have to give more out than that email, just the email name, not access to that email. Because uh, we shouldn't force our users to, to sign in with Facebook and give their marital status, their photos, their friends and everything to hellokitty.com because they want to put a comment on the web. So that's what Browser ID helps you with. And the code is incredibly simple. You do a browserid.org include.js, that's the JavaScript that we have that does the crypto in the browser and actually does the session controlling in the browser. You say get verified email and you have an assertion back. If the assertion came back, then everything is fine. If not, well, that person didn't have browser ID or didn't want to log in and you have the error case. Then you need to go to your server, in this case PHP, and you just call the assertion, the assertion that you get back. You send that together with the URL that you have to authenticate with and you send it back to another REST call and that's all you have to do. So like 10 lines of code, I've got a verified user without having to set up a database, without having to, to get their identity and lose it when I get hacked. So it's really wonderful because it's the control of the end user, what they want to give websites out there. Now, a big thing was going mobile. Um, like everybody's like, oh, the web is dead. We all have mobile phones. Like yeah, people that live in California think that. And uh, people that actually have data plans that don't charge them £7.50 per megabyte like mine does right now. So... We had these mobile, uh, mobile things in our pockets, like these great pieces of hardware. This is faster than my first computer that I had where I wrote my first website on, which was this big thing that basically heated my room as well. But we didn't have access to the hardware. We couldn't do the things that are in there from JavaScript and the web. And uh, we can now. There's APIs, and Robert is going to go through them. There's battery status, camera access, index DB. Vibrator, which we now call vibration to stop all the stupid jokes. <laughs> um, Sending SMS and doing calls from your JavaScript in the browser as well. So we, we wrote specifications for that. We gave them out. Other people can implement them as well. But all of that was really cool but didn't make much sense until we actually went further. And that is what we have to now at this boot to Gecko. And it's basically a phone, um, if I find mine, and I haven't rooted it earlier. Um, this is now a phone that looks like a real phone, funnily enough. Um, and it does all the things that normal phones do. It has like these apps and you can scroll them. But every single thing that you see here is HTML. It's HTML5. There's not any Java, there's not any uh, uh, Cocoa or whatever. So the whole thing is written in HTML using Firefox uh, as the rendering engine on top of a Linux core. Which means there's no IP and no copyrighted material in that whole phone. Which means providers can throw them out in the market really, really cheap. Which uh, Telefonica is, uh, is doing with us until the end of the year in South America and in, um, and in Spain. 
and hopefully somebody in America will will as well, because it's unfair that we buy a lot of uh, pay a lot of money and then not get access to the things that we just bought. It's a bit like putting tweets up there and not getting the old ones. <laughs> not being grumpy about that. Um, the whole thing is HTML. You can try it in the browser. Gaia is on GitHub. So this is actually the page that I have here. The same thing that runs on the phone if you want to try it out. You've got the, your WebGL and it runs on the phone for 60 frames per second. Awesome. Local host is offline. That doesn't make sense. But yeah, okay. Hey, it works. It's the open web. Well, should I look at the phones later on because that makes much more, is much more fun than that. And yeah, you can see it's like the whole thing is done in JavaScript and HTML. How am I? Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's all I had. So uh, look at all this stuff, uh, go into detail, and where you find information about this is developer.mozilla.org. That's the main thing. And my colleague Jeremy is going to talk to you in detail about what MDN means, how you can actually be part of this. So thank you very much for now.